Hello class, I'm back. Uh, this is lecture number 23 for History 102. Uh, we had just crashed the stock market, so to speak. So now we're going to talk about how this affects Americans in general and what President Hoover does or really doesn't do about it. Uh, the group of people that were harmed the most by the Great Depression and the crash of the market and the economy is not, you know, it may not be who you think of right off the bat. It was the middle class that suffered the most. So let's think about this rationally. The poor people in America, when the Great Depression hit, uh, were still poor. They had been poor for a while. They knew how to survive under adverse conditions. So they just kept on doing what they always did. The wealthy uh, were less wealthy, but they weren't suffering and they weren't in the streets. That's for sure. And let me give you an example of how one a wealthy person who, you know, who was relatively wealthy at the time, really came out of the Depression in prime position. And this is also related to what happened in the 1920s during Prohibition. Uh, as we'll find out, once FDR is elected in 32 and takes office in 33, one of the first things he's going to do is uh, end the experiment with Prohibition. And we'll talk about that in detail. But remember, we talked about how bootleggers and gangsters and others uh, made a tremendous amount of money during the 1920s off their profits from selling illegal booze. Anywhere between 12 and $18 billion totally was made. Now, once prohibition ends, that opportunity ends. One bootlegger who was operating... Uh, in the Boston area, uh, obviously is going to be put out of business by the end of Prohibition. And that person's name is Joe Kennedy. He was John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy's father. He was a bootlegger in Boston during the 20s and made, you know, considerable money doing it. Instead of turning into an organized criminal like a lot of these bootleggers did, he decided to go legit. And he took his profits that he had made bootlegging in the 20s. And in 1932 and 3, when Prohibition ends, he's going to take that money and he's going to invest it in the stock market when it's at its bottom in 1932-1933. And he's going to buy up original shares in a very little-known company, International Business Machines, today known as IBM. He was original stockholder of IBM, and that's how the Kennedys amassed their fortune, thanks to this very shrewd dealing by the old man, Joe Kennedy. So those sort of things can happen. Now, as far as the middle class, middle class people, you know, were cruising along nicely in the 20s. Uh, you know, typically back in that day and age, dad was the breadwinner, probably had a good job in a company, you know, was buying a home, they had a car, everything's going fine, might have invested some money in the market, and then everything crashes. And... Dad loses his job at the corporation. And before they know it, middle class people are going to lose everything. Because another big factor that I didn't mention last lecture that's going to occur during uh, the Great Depression is banks will close by the thousands and will be at a critical tipping point by the time we get to 1933 that we'll talk about. But here's the big difference from uh, living at the end of the 20s, early 30s to living today. When you lost your job, so let's say your middle class dad 
company tells you, sorry, we got to lay you off. Uh, you didn't go and file for unemployment because there was no such thing. Unemployment's not going to be created until 1935 as originally part of the Social Security Administration. So <clears throat> there's no unemployment on like today. And, you know, you'd come home after you lost your job, bummed out, have a family meeting and say, well, luckily enough, uh, I've stashed away some money for a rainy day so we can live off that until things get better. But unfortunately, banks were closing. And the big difference back then, if a bank closed and you had money in it, kiss it goodbye. It's gone. Because there was no such thing as the FDIC either. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That's another New Deal reform. And <clears throat> then on top of it all, there's really very limited social services. State of New York was leaders in creating social services for people, but most states had none. So if you lost everything, lost your job, lost your bank savings, you couldn't go down to the Department of Social Services and apply for aid from the government because it didn't exist. So middle-class people very quickly lost everything. They were evicted from their homes because they were foreclosed on. And if you look in your book on page 735, <clears throat> they end up living in these neighborhoods that they built out of you know scrap material that they found that they ironically nicknamed Hoovervilles. Because as we'll find out, President Hoover really did nothing about the plight that Americans were in. <clears throat> so, uh, people, middle-class citizens quickly found themselves living in these shacks they built in empty lots, and the form of uh, social services they're receiving is they had to stand in long soup lines at soup kitchens to feed their families. So, Things were pretty horrible. And then on top of it, uh, there was plenty of food around, but it was ending up rotting in the fields. And here's why. Farmers are still continuing to plant their crops. So in the beginning of 1930, as the steady decline is taking place between 29 and 33, a farmer would buy seeds with what money he had, plant them, put them in the ground, hope for the best, and come harvest time, with the steady decline in the economy, the price of grain crops and whatnot are dropping also. So a farmer will be in a very precarious situation where it will cost him more to harvest the product and get it to market then he could sell it for. So in order not to take even more losses, farmers had to make this very hard decision and just let the crops rot in the field or plow them under. <clears throat> and farmers were begging the United States government, send the army in to harvest our crops and get them to market. You can have them for free. And President Hoover refused. Hoover was a big business Republican, and he kept saying his big buzzword in all of his, excuse me, speeches was, quote, prosperity is just around the corner. Be patient. This is a natural economic cycle, and business will work its way out of it. He was against the government intervening. This was a time when we're dying for government intervention and he sat on his hands. Uh, he was calling for voluntary pri price freezes, which weren't happening, they continued to plummet. And he was calling for higher wages, which companies were not going to uh, do. 
So basically, that was his solution. He believed that private charities were the ones who could help the poor and that they could help them with, you know, soup lines and clothes donations and so forth. And that for the government to intervene and do something about it would, quote, undermine the character of proud Americans. Well, if you're a middle-class family living in a Hooverville, like on page 735, you're dying for the government to undermine your proud character and help you out. But the government refused, thanks to Hoover's lack of leadership. Uh, the, you know, the only thing that Hoover really did when he started to wake up in 1932, because it was an election year, he got Congress to pass a, uh, a sizable public works program. And Congress will pass a $2.25 billion public works uh, program to build things to put Americans back to work. But as we'll find out, compared to what the Roosevelt administration spends on public works programs, this is a drop in the bucket. $2.25 billion is nothing. And the major product, project that came out of that uh, program was the building of the Hoover Dam outside of Las Vegas on the Colorado River to dam up that river and, and uh, produce hydroelectric power. And it's part of the reason why Las Vegas located there. There's so much cheap electricity still produced by the Hoover Dam. That's what lights the strip on Vegas. <clears throat> but the Hoover Dam wasn't going to save the economy or America. So uh, 1932 rolls around. It's a re-election year. And uh, the final big mistake that Hoover will make is dealing with a group that becomes known as the Bonus Army. So let me explain to you what the Bonus Army is all about. Uh, these are World War I veterans. And after World War I, uh, in 1924, Congress passed a bill that was going to give all uh, World War I veterans a bonus that would be paid to them in 1945. It was seen as, here's an opportunity to reward these millions of men who fought bravely for America. And by the time 1945 rolls around, most World War I veterans will be considering retirement. So here's a bonus, so perhaps they can retire early. And it was all going to be paid by the government. And the money was set aside uh, for this purpose. So, in 1932 a large group of veterans got together and uh, they proposed the idea, why not pay the 3 million veterans of World War I their bonuses in 1932? Pay them that money now, they'll turn around and spend it in the economy and it could really help pick things up in America because you're putting money into the hands of 3 million uh, men who are probably, in all likelihood, unemployed at that point. So, this becomes a big movement known as the Bonus Army. And uh, in the they had been requesting this from the government. Uh, the government was not interested in this. President Hoover kept saying no. So, in the summer of 1932... Approximately 20,000 World War I veterans marched to Washington, D.C. from all over the country. And they set up a big, giant encampment on the mall in D.C., which, if you're familiar with D.C., is the open green area that runs from the Capitol down to the Lincoln Memorial with the Washington Monument and the White House sort of in the middle of it. They set this up as a giant campground and they basically tell the government, we're going to stay here until you pay us our bonus. So uh, if you take a look on page 738 in your book, there's a photograph 
of these guys and their campground they set up on the mall. And you can see one of the signs they have there, we need cash, not a tombstone, pay the bonus now. Because a lot of them are arguing, if this continues, I'll in all likelihood starve to death, so I won't be around in 1945 to collect my bonus. I suppose my family can put a tombstone on my grave then. So uh, there's periodic meetings with the White House in Hoover over payment of this bonus to them early. Now, uh, Hoover continues to basically say, no, we're not going to pay this early. And ultimately, uh, in the early fall of 1932, the leadership of the Bonus Army is called to the White House for an emergency meeting. And they think, oh boy, finally, Hoover's woke up. He's going to pay us our bonus. Well, when they get there, they're asked to supply the Hoover administration with a list of the 6,000 men out of the 20,000 that are camped out uh, in the mall that traveled the furthest to get there. And they're kind of curious, well, why would you want that? Because Hoover said, I'm going to pay their transportation home because you all have to leave, your fund's over, you can't be camping on the mall anymore. Now, this is not what these veterans wanted to hear. And I mean, these veterans, they're all unemployed. They got nothing better to do. Most of them all still fit in their uniforms from World War I, or some might be baggy because they don't eat very well. And this is not what they anticipated. So they go back and tell their comrades, here's what Hoover's offered us. And obviously they all just basically laugh and jeer. Yeah, right. We're not going anywhere. So when Hoover figures out they're not taking him up on his offer, he calls over to the War Department and says, I want you to send a group over there to the mall tomorrow to escort these men out of Washington, D.C. They need to leave. They're being evicted. So unfortunately, I've, you know, the, the president had no input into this. But the person that's given this duty is a very young, rambunctious general by the name of Douglas MacArthur. If you know anything about MacArthur, he's, uh, you know, can be a real hothead at times. So MacArthur goes over there with the contingency of the United States Army, and he starts barking out on a bullhorn that they've got one hour to pack up and leave. And these veterans are jeering back at him, you know, saying, you know, yeah, right, we're not going anywhere. So 15 minutes goes by, he warns him, you got 45 minutes to get out of here. And the clock keeps ticking, the veterans aren't going anywhere. So when the time limit expires, MacArthur gives his men an order that all those veterans knew what meant. He told them to fix bayonets. What that means is prepare for hand-to-hand -hand combat. So all these U.S. troops fix their bayonets on their rifles, and he orders them to march in to this camp. They start knocking down their tents and makeshift buildings they built, start setting some of them on fire. There's hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, some veterans are killed, unfortunately, in this process. And MacArthur follows orders. He runs them right out of Washington, across the bridge over the Potomac, into Virginia, and out of the town. But it's a complete disaster. And obviously, the press is going to have a field day with this. And when Americans read about U.S. soldiers fighting U.S. veterans, they're scratching their heads and wondering what the hell is going on. And a lot of them, and everybody, basically, points their finger at Hoover. So, 
remember, this is an election year, and with this event happening in the early fall, you can kiss Hoover goodbye. That's like the final nail in his political coffin. So, in this particular election, the Democrats obviously see their opportunity to steal back the White House with Hoover's lack of leadership. And they're going to nominate the rising star of the Democrat Party, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt, who I'll tell you a little bit about his life uh, after uh, we elect him, at this point in his career is the governor of the state of New York. And he's seen as a real great potential leader due to the leadership he exhibited in the state of New York. As I mentioned before, New York does have a rudimentary social services system and thanks to the actions of Roosevelt, who has also used state money to put people to work in public works projects, the state of New York is not suffering as bad as the rest of the country from the effects of the Great Depression. And most attribute this to Roosevelt's leadership as the governor of the state of New York. And remember, you got to keep reminding yourself, still at this point in history, New York is the number one state population-wise by far. Unlike today, we're fourth in population behind California, Texas, and Florida. So people really, really look to New York for leadership. So in this election, uh, FDR is going to clobber Hoover. FDR will receive nearly 23 million votes to Hoover's 15. And quite frankly, I'm surprised he got 15. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Franklin Roosevelt. He is indeed a distant cousin of Theodore Roosevelt. They're fifth cousins. Now, that's a distant cousin. Quite frankly, any of you in my classes could be my fifth cousin, and I'd have no clue. I, I don't know who my fifth cousins are, but, uh, you know, wealthy, prestigious families keep track of that sort of thing. Comes from the same wealthy New York family, the Roosevelts. Just like his famous cousin Theodore, uh, he went to Harvard University, graduated, after graduating, he entered Harvard Law School, but he left Harvard Law for a career in politics. Uh, he was first elected to the New York State Legislature, just like his famous cousin Theodore. Then he was appointed Assistant Secretary of the Navy, just like Theodore Roosevelt. And then he, you know, he had his unsuccessful bid for vice president. And then he was elected governor of the state of New York in 1928, the year before all this economic nightmare begins. Now, many of you probably know that Franklin Roosevelt was severely, uh, you know, disabled from having polio. He contracted polio as an adult. You know, polio was a horrible disease back then, usually inflicting children. But FDR uh, came down with it in 1921. He had attended a Boy Scout jamboree. He was a former Boy Scout at Harriman State Park in downstate New York. And from what people believe happened... He dined with the Boy Scouts and ate off a dirty mess kit and contracted polio from one of the other Boy Scouts. He came down with it that summer at his summer home up on Campobella Island. Uh, Roosevelt was an avid swimmer and he was out swimming one day and lost use of his legs and almost drowned. That's when they examined him and figured out he had polio. <clears throat> so from that point forward, he's severely disabled and has to wear these very painful metal braces on his legs uh, 
and really can't walk without the assistance of people by his side. In his private life, he's in a wheelchair all the time. But when he's public, he's always standing and not in a wheelchair because he does not want to appear weak, which back in this day and age would make you unelectable. <clears throat> so, to give you an idea of how conscientious he was about the wheelchair, there's only five pictures in existence of FDR in a wheelchair. And when he was governor of the state of New York, many of you may have been watching uh, Governor Cuomo deliver his speeches from the Capitol in the room with the panel walls. That's one of the offices of the governor, and that's the office that FDR operated out. One of those panels in the wall, if you push on it, I've been in this room before, reveals a secret elevator that FDR had built in the Capitol because he'd be driven over from the governor's mansion a block or so away. The, his limousine would go into the basement of the Capitol. He'd be put in his wheelchair, wheeled into this little tiny custom-made elevator that would only fit a wheelchair that would take him up to that office. He'd come out of the secret wall They'd wheel him over to his desk in his office, then stash the wheelchair back in the elevator, and that's how he operated. Now, one other thing that I need to mention about FDR, uh, just to sort of clear things up, he was very lucky to have a very brilliant wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, who will end up becoming his eyes and ears when he's president and travel around the country to make sure all the programs he's, he's implementing are working correctly. Now, here's a little tidbit on Eleanor Roosevelt. When she and Franklin were married, she didn't have to change her last name. She was a Roosevelt also. She was... Theodore Roosevelt's niece. And in fact, Theodore Roosevelt gave her away at the wedding because her dad was deceased. So technically speaking, Eleanor and Franklin were related, but very, very distant. She was the niece of his fifth cousin. My wife could be the niece of my fifth cousin and I'd have no clue. So, I mean, it's not, don't get creeped out by this and think, oh my God, you know, they're marrying in the, it's not that way. They're very, very, very distant relatives. Eleanor was a brilliant Harvard graduate also. That's where Franklin met her and he's awful lucky to have her. So, this is where I'll call it quits for this particular lecture. I'm going to pick up after I take a break. And we're going to talk about FDR jumping into action on like Hoover as soon as he's sworn in as president of the United States. So I'll talk to you shortly. I'm going to take a little break. See you soon.